David HaMelech says, sometimes he says, L'davin Mizmar, and sometimes he says, Mizmar L'davin. So the Gemara asks, what's the difference? Why sometimes is it L'davin Mizmar, and sometimes it's Mizmar L'davin? So the Gemara answers that there were times when David HaMelech was in such pain that he didn't feel David, he didn't know who he was, he didn't feel a sense of identity until there was a Mizmar first. And I think it's important in the Avoid of Tisha B'av to realize how much pain every single person is filled with. Sometimes it takes a mizmar to bring out the point that our identity is filled with pain. But it's the reality that fills our neshamas. So we know that Tisha B'av is also B'Sheh Shalom. It says that on Tisha B'av you're not supposed to greet people. You're not supposed to say hello. Why? 
what is behind that? Tisha B'Av should be a day of love, a day of embrace, a day of unity. And yet on Tisha B'Av, the Habach is the opposite. You're not allowed to say hello to anybody. You can't say much to them. So what's the Indian of not saying Shalom? I want to give two ideas. Both of them are very important. They both reflect in an authentic sense who we really are. So one point is that it says She'ila Shalom. She'ila Shalom doesn't mean don't say hello precisely, but it means to ask somebody how they're doing. To be shoyal in someone's shalom means to inquire about their well-being. And the fact that Tisha B'Av is also B'Shayla Shalom reflects the following idea. Imagine you know someone who just lost a loved one, a person who has just experienced a trauma, a person who clearly, clearly is suffering. How insensitive would it be to say to them, how are you doing? What do you mean, how am I doing? When you see the awkwardness in the question, in the question and the response, when you see someone who's clearly suffering, how are you doing? So there's an awkwardness, there's a shrug, there's something that's there, something which is gestured, but it, it's a pain. Because to ask someone how they're doing when they're filled with pain, so then the reality is that I'm not doing well. And in Tisha B'Av, we look around at every person, everyone that we're trying to form unity with, and we realize it's really insensitive to be shalom their shalom because every person is dealing with some horrible pain. Every person's pain is different. But on Tisha B'Av, it's an important, important avodah to feel, to be honest with oneself about what we are in pain about, what it is that's bothering us, what it is that we're upset about, what it is that we're struggling with, what it is that we feel that no one else understands about us, or about the circumstances and experiences that we've had in our lives that we don't understand why we need to have them. So that's why we're not Shail Shalom, because on Tisha B'Av the pain is real, and the Avoida is to see what it is. Nizmar Ladavid, who I really am. There's another idea as well, which is, again, an authentic point, but again, a painful point. When you're Shail and someone Shalom, it means that you care. To ask how somebody is doing means not just that's what I say and I make the motion and I ask you in a superficial sense, but I care to know how you're doing. And I would go the extra mile to know how you were doing. And unfortunately, it's not unique to any community in the world is faced with this. Judaism at large is the study of humanity, that we feel like Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim says tonight, Kol Re'el Bog Dubah which means that everyone who seemed loyal to Yerushalayim, everyone who seemed to love Yerushalayim, anyone who came to daven by Yerushalayim, so then Bagdubah is a sense of betrayal to Yerushalayim. Sometimes it takes a very tough moment in life to bring out the point, but we're often shocked, absolutely shocked, by who is not there for us. Sometimes we're surprised genuinely by those who are, but the shock and the pain which fills a human being, when those who should be there for them are not there for them, it's, there's a, a strong, strong pain which fills a person in that moment. And the Isser of She'ilah Shalom, which is telling us on Tisha B'Av is to realize that there's a lot of times when we're not gonna be there for people genuinely. And we fake it, and we cover it up with all senses of social graces, whatever it is that makes it seem like we're there for people. And we think possibly people are there for us, and suddenly something happens during the year and we're not really sure who is there and who cares for us. And we think about Yiddishkeit and it's in a certain sense the same thing. Are we there for Yiddishkeit? Are we there for Yerushalayim? Are we shoyl b'shoyl Yerushalayim? What the Pasuk says. Do we pay lip service to Yerushalayim to the base of Mikdash? Or how much do we care? How much would we really be there for? And that's the true measure, that's the true mark of what we're trying to accomplish on Tisha B'Av. So the first point is to realize it's also Rishayla Shalom because it's insensitive to ask a person in pain how they're doing. And second of all, to realize, are we really there? Are we really loyal? Who would be loyal to me? And where that leaves us, both of these points bring us to, is a feeling of isolation, of loneliness, of unsure of who we are, of vulnerability, and of a true experience of pain. But that itself is the avoid of Tisha B'Av, as an experience of identity. What you're in pain about it means you care about. What you care about means you have desire for. And for each of these moments, for each of the things that we wish was better, that we struggle with and grapple with, 
in each of the frustrations in our experiences, that itself is the point of connecting to the Rebbeinu Shalom. The only thing, the only entity, the only being, the only power that will ever, forever be loyal to us, will forever be Shalom, and our Shalom is the Ebesha. And the Rebbeinu of Tisha is to connect that being, to connect the Ebesha to loyal to the Ebesha, to be honest about the being, fully honest, not to think someone else will be there and cover it for us, not to think that necessarily there are loyal people who will protect us, but to realize ultimately it's up to the Ebesha. And when it's ultimately up to the Ebesha, we put our full kayak, our full emuna, and we yearn, we have desire to connect, to be closer to Taq Adash Baruch Hu, which culminates in the Pasuk, HaShivenu HaShem Eilach HaVinu Shuvach HaVinu Shuvach HaVinu
Yeah.
just a small hahara. He says, Shifri Kamai Nide Echnechach Bnei Hashem. So we're supposed to pour our hearts. But the Pasuk says, we pour our hearts like water. What is the water? So simply understood, it's the tears. But the Medrash says something else. The Medrash says, Ein Ma'im El When we sit in pain and we don't know what to do, we don't have a base of Mikdash, Ebishtah doesn't tell us what he wants from us. We say in the Kinas, Ein Lon Yushir Rak Atayra Hazois. We have something which remains. We have the Torah. The Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us is Ki Arachmecha Arabin. It's a mercy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's a grant of an opportunity to people to still connect. It's our only shot. If you don't know what means to take, if you don't know how to get there, you feel only in pain, the answer is only through Torah. Without Torah, there's no other way that we have today. But the means of Torah of Shifi Kamayim Libeh, of opening one's heart to the Mayim, to a Mayim El Torah, to experience growth with the Ibishta. That's the only way that we have, but it's a tremendous nakama. It's a rachamim that our Kaddish Baruch Hu left us. That no matter where we are in Gullahs, we're able not only to survive, but we can flourish. Because we have Torah, as long as we connect with it, we feel powerful and confident that we can still connect.
So by following the Gemara, the Gemara tells us that the base of Midrash was destroyed because of sin askinam, because of base hatred from one Jew to the next. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe crowned the idea of avaskinam, loving every Jew no matter who they are. I'm sure every single person in this room has been to a Chabad house across the world and felt the love of a Chabad Shliya bringing them in, bringing you in to their home. The Lubavitcher Rebbe every Friday night would leave 770 very late. He would sit and learn, and only after a couple of hours he would leave 770 and walk back to his home a couple minutes away in Crown Heights. Every Friday night, in order that the Rebbe didn't walk alone, there were three Bachrim, three young guys, who would trail the Rebbe about 100 feet behind him and watch so that the Rebbe didn't walk alone and that he was safe. It was one Friday night, it was minus 10, minus 20 degrees, it was freezing, freezing cold. Unbearable. The Rebbe didn't have such paraphernalia to wear. He had his, his kapata, his coat, a small, thin wool coat, and his hat. The Rebbe walks out of 770 on the Friday night in the freezing cold to start walking home. And the three Bachrin start trailing him, again, 100 feet behind him. All of a sudden, along the walk, an old lady stops the Rebbe in the middle of the street to talk to him, to ask him a question. The Bachrin behind are going crazy. It's chutzpah. The Rebbe's freezing. It's minus 20 degrees. How is she stopping him in the middle of the road? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes later, the Bachram are getting antsy. And they figured among themselves that when this lady leaves the Rebbe, they're gonna give her a lot of muscle. They're gonna tell her what's wrong with you. How dare you stop the Rebbe on his walk home in the freezing cold night. Finally, after a half hour, the woman turns away from the Rebbe and starts walking away. And the Bachram, the, the guys, they get ready to give their mustard. But all of a sudden, the Rebbe, he doesn't continue home. He turns around and he looks straight at the Bachram. He eyes them down. And he waits, looking at them. And so the woman walks by them, continues walking, and out of sight. 
The Rebbe knew that the, what the Bokhar wanted to do, what the guys wanted to do. And the guys knew that as long as the Rebbe looked at them, they were not going to give any muscle. The Babacher Rebbe, it's a simple story. He was a person who cared for every single Jew, no matter what. In the middle of the night, in the freezing cold weather, to give time, to give love, no matter who they were, to feel their pain.
that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives, whether it's from kite, relationships, we're not sure about the burden of Yiddishkeit. I think that the, the two previous songs that we just sang really encapsulate how to cling to Yiddishkeit desperately at any point. Number one is, Habit Mishamayim. You have to think about where we come from. Esa'inai Elahari means, Elahari means the others. Who do we come from? Who has brought us to this point? How are we here still at this point in Jewish history? It's absolutely mind-boggling. And it's only through extreme, extreme sacrifice by people who came in front of us. And we owe it to them. Whether it's someone directly who impacted you or someone you don't know. But there is no question if you reflect on why you exist and why you're sitting here as a Yid today, there's no question that you owe it in the sacrifice of the people who came before you. And number two is that it's the desire of every person, this Akeni, is that we all want to know that we're going to have grandchildren who are Yireh like him. We don't know how we're going to get there. Sometimes it's very difficult to believe. How's it going to be? With everything coming in front of us, how are our grandchildren going to be from Yiddin? But we're the link. We owe it to ourselves because we're the link between the grandparents and grandchildren. We put those two things together, and we think and we desire what our grandchildren should look like, and we think about what our grandparents went through to bring us here, so then that pushes us. It's a very motivating point. I come to the Kaya. Thank you.
Yeah. 
6.30 a.m. and 9 o'clock a.m.